Hey, glad you could join us. I'm Tom Graham. I'm the regional director out of the Nashville market, if you can't tell. At least I have a, a good old guitar in the background, right? But I am in Alabama, so don't hold that against me. But I wanted to welcome you guys to the How Vendor Consolidation Reduces Cost and Complexity. We have a great speaker today. We're going to get to Scott and his team at Airspring. And I'm going to also kind of give you a quick little introduction of our MC, who is Sonia Milin. But myself, real quick background, I don't know if you can tell or not, maybe by this way, but I've been mistaken twice now for Bobby Flay. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but one time it was in a casino. So I don't know if Bobby Flay goes to casinos a lot, but if you taste my cooking, there's no complication there. I am not Bobby Flay. So with that, I wanted to say welcome again. I know we've got a ton of you guys on the call today. It's going to be very beneficial. So I'd like to get right into it, put my old reading glasses back on, and I want to introduce you to Sonia. Her background is that she worked for, I, I just learned this the other day, almost 12 years with one of our providers with Effortless on desktop as a service. With that, she carries a lot of IT experience, a lot of business continuity planning, one of the things I think is really key about Sonia is every year she organizes the Techie Toy Drive. I think that's a, a marvelous thing. Uh, it's always fun to get together and see the kids do something really good with a lot that we do in this technology space. Also, her career started in the healthcare space and has worked for a number of companies. And uh, with these, she's a implemented extensive pandemic planning measures, which I think is quite appropriate for today's measures, and also has worked with eliminating physical hardware such as servers, computers, and enable both staff and also remote workers to the, the best of their abilities. Very appropriate with today's environment. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Sonia Maline, extraordinaire. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that introduction, Tom. I'm happy to have you here, and it's nice to see uh, some lightheartedness and some joy, so thank you. So yes, Sonia Moline here, and a little bit of housekeeping. Thanks for those of you who put you know, some chats in the chat box. That's really nice. It helps us know you're here. Let us know where you're calling in from. I know we have a very national team, so it's kind of fun to see where everybody's at today. And with everybody, you know, a lot of people working from home, I think there's even people kind of on the road traveling who kind of check in, and I've, I've seen some of that too, which is nice. And a little more housekeeping, we will be having a question and answer period as usual. So if you have questions that come up after you hear from myself or Tom or Scott, you please do um, ask questions because that's, that's what a roundtable is all about, right? It's about getting your ideas and questions answered because um, chances, if you have a question, probably somebody else might have that same question. So, um, and to reward you and just to let you know how much we appreciate your questions, Airspring has offered a two $25 gift cards. And then at the end, we have a pretty fun little game that we're going to play that is also audience participation for a $100 gift card. So lots of fun um, prizes and things like that um, today to keep us all on our toes. So without further ado, I wanted to just talk today about what this whole idea of vendor consolidation is. Businesses and nonprofits, they cannot invest in innovation without first optimizing the way that they source their services and vendors. And professionals like us at Technology Source are facing right now a critical objective for customers this year, and that is to optimize operations and reduce costs to free up funds for innovation. Or as one of my customers put it so clearly on a call just recently, it was to free up funds for saving a job at her organization. So I thought that was kind of definitely pulled up my heartstrings and I thought made me feel good about what I'm doing, right? <laughs> so if we can do that, we know we're doing something good. So how do we accomplish this, though, when our customers' budgets are widely impacted by a pandemic? I mean, that's the question of the day, right? So while businesses are trying to scale back during these uncertain times, um, sometimes having an expansive portfolio of vendors can really hide a lot of opportunities for them. So I do have a quick question for my audience if I can figure out how to launch this poll. Go ahead and answer this one for me. 
what best describes you or your customer's pain points as it relates to vendor sprawl. So I'm going to go ahead and start with that. And then question number two, while you're voting, is what are the benefits of consolidation of vendors for you as a customer? What would you imagine the benefit of consolidating? And then also, um, or if it's, it's for your customer, what benefits have you seen? So go ahead um, and vote. Everybody, just go ahead and vote. You should see a, okay, good, the votes are coming in. I was like, uh-oh, it's not working, <laughs> but it's working. All right, votes are coming in. All right, take your time. You've got about 30 seconds, so just go ahead and vote, and then we will talk about the results. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, and it looks like we've got over half of you have voted, 58% have voted, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. If we could get a little higher. One more vote, guys. All right. That's good. We've got almost, almost 30 votes, almost 36 votes. All right, I'm going to end it. All right, so what best describes the pain points? I'm going to share the results, and you can see now um, – Inefficient procurement process is the number one. Um, and I would agree, as an IT director in my previous world, um, I would say it, it is inefficient. Um, there's, people have no idea how much time is wasted on finding the right phones and internet and you know, um, cloud solutions and VoIP and all of these different things that you, know, you can spend money on. Um, so that would be a big one. Um, and it looks like in second place was cost increase, and I would agree there. And then it looked uh, like nobody said none. So we all realize vendor sprawl is, is a problem, right? So the, the problem is real. Um, shadow IT is an interesting one. That didn't get very high, but I think that one is a big one. Um, you know, that's just everyone having access to purchase things, and so there's all these products and services that you may not even know you have. Uh, all right, let's look at some of the benefits. Ah, clearly it was reduced cost. Um, so that is, is a big one. And I think that's why we're, we're kind of all come to the table today. As, as I mentioned earlier, customers are looking for that reduction of cost. It is something that even before a pandemic, I mean, it's always a good thing. But right now when, you know, budgets are really tightening, um, that can be a big one. Um, the next one down uh, I see is the ability to automate the procurement process and increase business agility. And that's always a good thing, right? Being able to transform your business, um, you can jump on opportunities, but if you have 50 vendors, you have to go to each one because it all just could affect, you know, kind of like a domino effect. One on here that I see kind of low, which is makes me sad because I think it's a really big one is compliance. That is a huge benefit when you have fewer vendors. The more vendors you have, the more opportunities for risk you're introducing. Um, so if you can reduce those risks from a compliance standpoint, it's huge. It's a lot less contracts to manage from a compliance standpoint uh, for like business associate agreements. You're also having less vendors uh, you have to vet and you, know, you don't have to check as many vendors against you know, OIG or GSA databases if you're looking in from a healthcare standpoint because all of that is extremely burdensome. Um, when you're talking about multiple vendors. So that is just sort of uh, a really great um, kind of glimpse into our customers' world. And thank you so much to our customers on here who shared and to our advisors. I know there's a ton of advisors that I see on here, so thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop that share. And now I'm going to just check the chat box really quick. All right, I see a bunch of people calling who are here today. We have Maine, Whittier, uh, we have people coming in from Phoenix, Atlanta. Nice. Looks like a lot of happy people. So thank you so much for, for joining Huntington Beach. I love it. Thank you. All right. Well, now we are going to, I, I don't know if you guys knew, but we have uh, a special guest today, and I, I'm guessing you knew. This guest is Scott Haley, and he is the National Director of Channel Programs for Airspring. Now, he is a Texas native, and I asked him earlier uh, where we, he was calling in from today, and he did say he's in his home office in Texas. Um, now, we're happy to have Scott 
for a lot of reasons, um, but really it's because of his tenured history and his success in the industry. He has been uh, in this industry for over 20 years, um, working to enable partners, businesses, uh, managed service providers, and really work on implementing leading technologies such as SD-WAN and cybersecurity. His experience ranges from being successful as an on-the-street sales rep to VP of business development. So um, we are really excited to have him here today. Um, Scott, let me just ask you this. First of all, good morning, good afternoon, I'm guessing for you. Good morning, yes. It's still, well, no, it's actually just turned afternoon. It's 12 noon in Dallas. All right. Well, um, let me just ask you this. So. Uh, based on, you know, what's going on with everything right now, what is Airspring doing w in the face of everything going on? Like, well, how are you helping customers right now? Is this, you know, we've been talking about this vendor consolidation. Is that a big area that you're seeing improvements for customers right now? Yeah, it's, it's a vendor consolidation. It's also because of people having to shelter at home in so many places and having to work from home. So remote connections with UCAS and connectivity, all of that type of stuff, uh, it, it encompasses the whole realm. But definitely vendor consolidation is a biggie. Great. Well, take it away. Tell us more about Airspring and, and this concept of vendor consolidation so that our, our customers and advisors can learn more from you. Sure, sure. If you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody. Sure. All right, everybody. I appreciate everybody being on, both the, uh, the customers that are on, on with us today, obviously all the technology source advisors. Uh, we appreciate it. Just a little quick, quick note here. Um, if you, everyone asks about, you know, is wondering what's what's with the eye patch. So just so you know, I am the poster child for every uh, every mom in America. Um, I actually was hit in the eye with a stick playing army when I was four years old. Uh, so uh, all the moms in my neighborhood asked me to come speak to their little boys. Anyways, today's topic is uh, vendor consolidation reduces cost, overhead, and increases profitability. I'm going to skip through that. Um, Here's some of the questions, and, and some of this was covered by Sonia already. So what's the average number of vendors organizations have to achieve a single initiative? And the hint is it's more than nine, uh, just so you know, and we're going to cover that. Can you, can you really get more with less? What are the critical objectives sourcing procurement and vendor management professionals that are facing this year? What is vendor sprawl? We're going to define that a little bit. And then we're just going to touch on what are the top four benefits of vendor consolidation. And then lastly, what we think is the best solution. So I'm not going to go through and read all this, but some of this was touched on by Sonia. But the MIT Technology Review in June, uh, their June edition, um, they talked about that the reality is you can't invest in innovation without first optimizing procurement. And so the critical things that they're, they're facing are they need to opt optimize operations to reduce cost and to free up funds so that they have money to invest. So reducing cost is, is important. And then how do you accomplish both when your budget has been wildly thrown off track? And that's happened a lot with this pandemic. We've got a lot of people that now they're having to subsidize uh, people's remote offices, a lot of things like that. There's just a lot of budget things that have happened. So while organizations are trying to go lean during this challenging economic, a bloated vendor portfolio conceals a lot of opportunities to get more with less. So business IT ecosystems today, they're very sophisticated. Um, you know, at one point you just basically had your LAN inside and then you had a telephone system and that was about it. Nowadays with the convergence of digital transformation, I mean, there are so many uh, SaaS and app applications and cloud applications. It's just become very complex, even for small businesses nowadays. And so on average, organizations are trying to manage more than 10 vendor relationships for a single objective or single initiative. So vendor sprawl, which we've mentioned now three times, what that means is it increases cost, it has a risk of shadow IT, risk of compromising security, inefficient vendor management, and a lack of accountability. The other issue is a lot of times things are run in disparate systems when you've got a bunch of vendors, and so then you have start having silo projects and silo communications um, instead of being open communication across the entire enterprise. So executive leaders and procurement departments are finding that consolidating services not only cuts cost, but it also helps with inefficiencies. So organizations are overwhelmed by the proliferation of contractual agreements. This happens a whole lot because a lot of times you'll have multiple agreements even with one vendor. And if you've got 10 or more vendors for every single initiative or objective, 
you start running into 20, 30, 40 different contracts. Then you're getting into risk, you're getting into compliance issues, legal issues. So those are all really important. So more and more technology and data service vendors are being asked, what can you replace? And what this means is what products and solutions are available to address multiple user groups across the enterprise, but then reducing the number of vendors that you have to meet that. And the last thing I'll ask before we ask some questions is, vendors with a narrow set of solutions often struggle with this request. Either they can't answer the question or they can't deliver on their promises. And all that's saying is if, if, if a company says, you know what, I really do want to, want to consolidate my vendors, then going to your vendors and finding out who can really do it and who can't, that's a key component to, uh, to taking this process and grabbing hold of this and taking control. What are the, what are the major benefits of vendor consolidation? So um, one is cost savings, which Sonia has, has talked about. There's really a lot of different aspects of that. One is finding a vendor that can provide good competitive cost-effective savings. There's a balance in that, obviously, because whomever the vendor is, they actually have to make enough margin or profit on their services to actually run their company properly and to support their customers properly. So there is a balance there, but cost savings is really important. So in this, in this time, we have to cut our margins, I can tell you as a carrier, a little bit to try to help our clients. Um, another is time savings, and what we mean in this is um, the more vendors you have, the more people or your, of your staff of a company that you've got to deal with that have to learn all these different vendors, and that's not just, you know, one vendor could have 5, 10, or 15 different contacts in it, depending on what the application is. So then you start getting into 30, 40, 50, 60 different contacts for different, different vendors, and it's just a real strain on suppliers. It's a heavy strain on accounts payable, uh, making sure that things are right, who do they talk to when there's a problem. So consolidating that is important. Another one's accountability, and this is a huge thing. Uh, the more vendors involved in an initiative, the more difficult it is to determine who should be held accountable for issues and challenges. And I can tell you as a company, we really try to minimize any issues and challenges, obviously. It's in our best interest, uh, as well as our customers. But I don't care who you are. In the technology industry, there are so many different moving parts and so many different people touching things. You're going to have issues and challenges. It just, it, it's the nature of, of the business. Um, so knowing who to talk to and having someone that you can actually pick up the phone and talk to as well and not just chat unless that's what you want to do, um, that's important. And then last but not least is stronger partnerships. So listen, this is all business and, and there's services and there's features and there's benefits. But at the end of the day, this is people doing business with people. And so the, the less number of vendors that you have, the more that you can actually develop personal one-to-one -one relationships with that vendor and that your staff internally with their different department heads and different initiatives can build strong relationships with the staff of that vendor as well. And that's a key, key thing because people, once they get to know each other, they just uh, they relate better, they solve problems better. Um, it, it just makes for a much smoother relationship. Hey, Scott. So, yes. We have a couple questions. I thought, uh, would you want yep. to, along the way, do that? Well, One of the questions from right now. Dawn's, yeah, Don C. asked, what are the risks of vendor consolidation? Maybe uh, you've got a couple key points on that. You know what? I, to be honest with you, I don't think there's many risks. Um, I guess you could... Technically, you could say if you had everything with just one vendor, you know, maybe, um, you know, it's a less diverse uh, as far as resilience you, you might consider that. So, so in that sense, but there's a difference between, and, and, I, and you'll see this later on, I'll, I'll talk about this with us as a company. There's a difference between having a vendor that has multiple resilient solutions underneath versus one solution and one point of failure. Yeah, that's definitely true. Did we have one more question? Yeah, let's do it. Um, I Let's see. Are you able to consolidate existing carrier agreements? This is actually one of our advisors, and they said they're very familiar with Airspring, and it's, they said they know that you resell many carriers for access. How do you engage the customers on the solution? Okay. Let me do this, if you don't mind. I'm going to put that one just on hold because we're actually yeah. going to go into to Airspring next. Okay. And I'll share some of that. And if I don't cover that well enough, 
please bring that question back up, okay? Okay, but um, that was by John D. So if we could put his name in the hat, right. that would be a good one, as well as Dawn. So, all right, go ahead. So the next question is, we think we are a great solution. So that's the whole point of this, guys. <laughs> Obviously, I'm from AirSpring, so I want to promote why we think vendor consolidation, and, and our company is actually built and designed for vendor consolidation. It's to be a one-source solution. So that's why this is really important to us. We're actually built that way as a company. So you can see, and I'll flesh some of these out. We're not going to go through a pro product set, don't worry, but we are a managed global SD-WAN provider, both globally and domestic. We provide full UCAS, full voice and data services. We actually even do long distance, um, high volume long distance services like for call centers. We do managed security and we do managed network uh, as well. And we call this the, the AirSpring Advantage. So here's just real quick some highlights of the company. We were founded in 2001. We are debt free and profitable. We're a family owned business. Three brothers own the business. They started it and own it and operate it. We're not for sale. That's important. Um, we're located, uh, our headquarters, this is actually our office building in Los Angeles or in Van Nuys. That's our headquarters. We've got 15 regional channel managers across the United States uh, to help all of our, our advisors and partners regionally. Multi-location and or multi-service experts. That's one of our top two highest values, that and SD-WAN. We currently serve over 20,000 customers globally. We actually have the largest IP network in the United States. A lot of people don't realize this. We process more than four and a half billion calls per month. We have two global knocks that are 24 seven, 365. Um, we kind of talked about one source solution or one stop shopping and then one responsible vendor. And we'll kind of talk about why that's important. So just real quick, just, I'm not gonna show you our, our whole network. These are just our major points of presence or major pops all over the globe, as you can see. So we do have a global network. So part of that question about carrier networks, we are a carrier but we have wholesale carrier agreements with 35 different uh, carriers across the United States and globally. So all of the carriers do this, just so you know, even the biggest, AT&T. In their out-of-territory out of areas, they lease network from everybody. All carriers do that. So we have 35-plus carrier agreements, and we actually bring them from the customer's premise into our POP, our closest POP, into our network. So that's how that works. So we don't assume existing carrier agreements. That we can't do because the carriers, they won't allow it. That's a retail relationship. However, I will cover later, we do uh, monitoring of all circuits, and that's free of charge. We also offer free monitoring of third-party circuits, even if it's not our circuit, if they've got other either circuits or services with us. That's a pretty, pretty key deal. The other thing is, in addition to obviously all of our domestic, which is where most of our business is, um, we can serve connectivity in 100 plus uh, countries now. So just to kind of give you a, an idea. One-stop shopping, I really like the term one source solution. That's kind of what we are. Um, it's a single point of contact. So again, we're getting into vendor con consolidation. So instead of having most companies, even small, they've got primary network. Some have primary and backup network. They either have a phone system on premise or they have unified communications or hosted PBX. They may have one or more technology services as well. Um, they could have four or five vendors just for their normal business. I don't care if they've got 10 or 15 employees even. So with us, you've got one point of contact, one bill, one customer service center to call. We offer white glove support uh, to, our, to our customers. So that's the, some of the values. So. I won't go through all of these, but I just want you to see we do a lot of different services, okay? So all cloud and voice communications. Our Air PBX is our UCAS or hosted PBX platform. Like I said, we're one of the largest SIP trunking providers in the country. High volume uh, LD for call centers, and that's both inbound and outbound. We still can do PRIs and TDM analog circuits, and we can do POTS. It's not a core business for us, but we do so many multi-locations that have pots for alarm lines and elevator lines and things like that. But we do, we can use them for voice as well, obviously. And then we do primary and backup network. So we have agreements with all the major carriers, also all the major cable codes. Uh, we can also provide fixed wireless. We can provide satellite when needed for like our rural uh, oil and gas type companies, all that kind of stuff. We talked about SD-WAN briefly. That is a huge initiative for us as a company. We are a specialist at SD-WAN, both domestic and globally, and that's really important nowadays with so many things being connected to the cloud for normal everyday uh, business services. You just don't want to go down. 
And then we offer full 4G and uh, LTE wireless services. Not, we don't sell mobile phone service. That is for backup network. And then 5G, when it comes, it will be available as well. And then we can do full managed failover. We, like I mentioned, we monitor all circuits. We put in managed routers and switches, managed security. Uh, right now on the security side, we've just got uh, Cisco Meraki's. We're actually bringing in uh, Fortinet at the end of Q3. So we'll have the Fortinet security platform as well. I'll stop right there. Any, any thoughts or questions? Yeah, there's a few. We had a question here, and this is probably more for when we were talking about the coverage area. Do you have coverage in kind of remote islands like the Caribbean, places like that? Would that be something? Not for, now we don't, we don't do UCAS outside mm -hmm. of North America. Okay. Right? So we don't have local dial tone in the Caribbean. We don't have local dial tone in Europe. But okay. we have connectivity. So if one of our underlying network providers has connectivity, then we can usually get connectivity in those remote island locations or other places. Okay, and that was from Daryl, if you could please make that note there, Tom. Next one. Oh, George ha had a question, but then you answered it live already. So you could put George in there though, George K. And that was about rural areas. And I will say, yes, absolutely. I kind of live in a rural area and AirSpring has been very helpful at making sure there's coverage for us up here. And then, oh, here's another one. Brandon B, uh, for a Meraki security appliance, is it just the MX appliance or are you offering the full Meraki networking line? No, it's just the MX appliance right now. Okay. Um, again, Fortinet's gonna come in and replace most of that. The Meraki is so simplistic on its on its firewalls. It's not good for high level security, but where it is good is for a lot of our multi location retail and restaurant, where their margins are super thin. It's just more cost effective, and that that's the level of security they need because it does offer PCI uh, compliance. Right. Great. I think those are those are some good ones from now. Uh, we have more, but if you want to keep going, and then we'll keep going with the questions in a minute. Okay. So we've, we've, we keep talking about, you keep, I keep using the term one source solution. So that's, that's real in, important to us. So customers or companies choose AirSpring for speed of delivery, the experience of that, and then the overall support. And we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. But also, because we um, have wholesale agreements with all the major carriers as well as a lot of Tier 2 carriers, we're, a, we're one of AT&T's largest wholesale customers, just to give you an example, we're platinum uh, wholesale level with, with AT&T. So we do a whole lot of AT&T business. I've got great pricing. Their network's great, and I don't disparage carriers, but for example, if, if AT&T or Verizon or CenturyLink or Windstream, um, if they could service the $200,000 a month client or less effectively, we wouldn't be in business, but they can't. And, that, and they'll tell you that. Their focus is on large enterprise accounts. That, that, that's where they support people. Their network is fantastic. They just, if you're a smaller company, you just can't get the kind of customer service and support, both at the technical level and just the customer service line level. And so what we offer is actually the best of both worlds. We offer the global multi-billion dollar network qualities, but then we wrap our own personal high-touch customer service and support around that. So that's why, why our clients like to use us. So here's just a quick smattering of some of our clients. I'm not going to go through and read all these. We've got clients of all different sizes. So we've got clients from the one location office that's got maybe five or six employees, you know, up to the, gosh, probably our largest client is probably 800 or 900 locations. So we've got of all different kinds of sizes. So we talked about personalized service. So we, we offer what we think is white glove customer service. And what I'm going to flesh that out for you is really on the next screen. So we treat every order as a project. So we have a, a project manager or a project coordinator that's assigned to an account when it comes in, when the order is signed and submitted. Once we do the data entry, scan the data, make sure we've got everything, then a project co coordinator takes hold of it and then arranges a, uh, a kickoff call with the customer and the advisor present on the call, walk through everything, make sure everybody's on the same page, make sure all the objectives are on the same page. Um, they will be the one point of contact for everything. But on that call will also be one of an uh, part of the engineering team that's assigned to that, uh, that project, and then also one of the provisioners or the provisioning team, the lead person there that's assigned to that project. So we manage and we project manage every implementation from A to Z, okay? 
once it's actually implemented and turned up and active and everybody says, yes, it's okay, then it goes to an account management team. So we want both implementation support, but then we want post-implementation support, and that's what's key. Real quick got, question since we were just talking about service. Um, sure. I, I did have one that came in. It was a statement with a question. So the question is, personally, I would take a small, and this is from William B., for, for the win there, Tom. I will take a small and tactical organization any day of the week over a large and cumbersome one. Um, that kind of reminds me of that, that show, The Office, when they're in there and they're trying to sell the paper. I think that's their main business, they sell paper. And they're trying to win this customer. He's like, well, I've got the biggest paper supplier in the world or whatever. And then they're like, well, call them. And they sit there and they're trying to reach them and they're on hold. And then, and he goes, here, let's call my company. And he calls and they like just, hi, how are you? Oh, hey, George. You know, they're just, and I thought that was interesting. Um, and I think that's definitely the case. And so the question here is, how big does the organization have to be to be effective? I think that was the question that we can come yeah, from. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's how big. The question is, is it nimble? Right. Is it easy to do business with? Those are a couple of big things. And then when there, if there is a problem or a challenge that arises, can you actually talk to somebody? Yeah. I mean, I mean listen, I'm, I'm all about instant messaging and email. I hate phone mail, uh, phone voicemail tag. I hate it. <laughs> but at the same time, there are times I don't want to get stuck in a chat session with a uh, customer service rep. There's times when it's right. okay. But but most of the time, I actually want to talk to somebody. And it's kind of interesting. I didn't put it in our presentation, but our average answer time for our customer service line is 11 seconds. Wow. That's that, great. And, and that's factual. Anyways, that, that's a big deal. You won't get that with the larger the carrier, the longer the wait time. I can almost assure you. Good. So All right. I, I just I, wanted to point I, that one out. You bet. I am not going to read this slide. I just want you to see this. Every customer gets this escalation slide, this escalation list. And so every department has an escalation list that goes all the way down to the actual CEO on every one of these. I don't know many companies that actually put their CEO, and that's his real phone number. He gets about one call per week, and, it, and it's, it's not for I needed help, I didn't get help before. It's I wanted to see if this is your real phone number. This is not a voicemail line. This is not his assistance number. This is his office number. So that's how sure we are that we're not going to get to him. Uh, let me just put it that way. I'm just going to show you, and we're almost to the end here, but I want to give you kind of three different short kind of case studies or case examples of clients. So these are actual clients. So this is one of our clients, a commercial property management company. When they started, they started with 26 locations. They've now expanded to 200 locations with us. So it kind of gives you some of the idea of multi-location, multi-service. Their challenges were they had numerous internet providers across all their different sites. They also had a mix of technology services. So they had at some sites, they had unified communications. Some sites had PBXs. Some sites had POTS or planar telephone lines with a little key system. And then all of that was just being managed by different people at their headquarters, uh, different property managers on, on site and one small third-party MSP, which wasn't managing too much. The other issue was they needed network security. They didn't have any firewalls or VPNs across the entire network at all. And then one other thing that was happening to them is that their ISPs, different ISPs were getting consolidated. So different, they had a lot of, they had some Ethernet fiber circuits, DIA, but they also had a lot of cable codes. And those different cable codes were getting bought up by larger cable codes. And then there was issues of not knowing who to call, bills not being direct, and then they got ran into cost overruns. So what we did is we came in with our UCAS team and we designed a single unified solution for the entire, all of their sites. Having one UC, we gave them free polycom phones. We did on-site installation and configuration and testing at every location. And then as they brought up another location, we just did that again until everything is covered so they're on one unified platform. And then we did the same thing on the, on the connectivity. So where they already had broadband, we put in our own broadband. Where they had DIA Ethernet or fiber, then we, we did that as well. We put in SD-WAN with Cisco Meraki's. So on the Cisco Meraki side, we can actually do their, their SD-WAN. It's kind of an SD-WAN light, to be honest with you, but it's what was needed for this, this account. 
And then obviously, like I mentioned, had a dedicated project manager to completely implement the entire thing and then enhance the accounts management team afterwards. Next customer is a multi-location credit union we have. They had eight city branches and then they had 11 remote locations. So their challenges were they were geographically dispersed among three counties. This was out in California, actually. One of the big things that they had an issue with is because of the wildfires that kept reoccurring out on the West Coast, they kept having issues with business continuity. That, that was just a big, a big problem. They also had kind of a mesh. Their, their network was just built organically. So it's like, it's like one location would have one kind of network or service, another one would have another with different providers. It was just kind of a mishmash of stuff. But here was another challenge with them. Another challenge was a lot of their circuits or services that are mentioned up here, they were still in term agreements for. So remember I talked about we, we can monitor third-party circuits and we can do it free of charge if they have other services with us. So that's what we did uh, for them. We actually did an SD-WAN overlay over all of their existing network where we could replace um, the fiber or broadband with our managed services. We did that. But those services that were still under contract, then we just did third-party monitoring for them free of charge. So we can ping their other service provider as long as they give us a public IP. And if the service shows it goes down, we actually proactively place a trouble ticket with that carrier on their behalf. And we work it until it's brought to resolution. So it just kind of gives you an idea of what we can do. So last, this is the last little, uh, little case study. So this was a one location client and they had their corporate staff there, but they had a hundred plus customer service agents. So they were, they're kind of a healthcare support company. And they interface with a lot of pharmacies. A lot of their objectives were they, they needed to be up all the time. They needed to be fully connected. They were having problems with their current fiber provider going up and down a lot. Um, that was a problem. They had a, uh, a, an on-premise phone system that was kind of end of life. They were having some real issues there, not to mention should there be some kind of disaster uh, issue or something, there was no way to even work remotely because it was an on-premise legacy phone system. So they needed a system that could seamlessly integrate with the database of, of numerous pharmacies that they uh, deal with as well. We just went in and we put in a high quality fiber internet circuit. We, we right sized it as far as the bandwidth they needed for their use application. So our engineers des, uh, decided on what that would be. And then we did an inexpensive backup cable co circuit as well for them so that they'd have that. We didn't put an SD-WAN so we could do automatic failover. Uh, between the two circuits anytime that they needed. Actually, with our SD-WAN and this solution, uh, because we're using our Velo solution, uh, we also uh, aggregated the bandwidth as well uh, for them, so they're not just having a dead circuit sitting there passive as a backup. So we did a full UCAS implementation, full SD-WAN implementation, and what that gave them is the ability to have 100% uptime. They had backup circuits and SD-WAN to manage everything. So I will stop there. Any, any questions come in that you want answered? Yeah, I think we have them. So what is your recommended solution for clients who need a wireless internet solution? And I think they wanted, this, this person wanted to know from both a small size business approach and also a large enterprise, are there solutions available for those types of okay. customers? So if you could clarify, when you say wireless, do you mean cellular wireless or some other? And then, and then are you talking primary or back? Yeah, I think uh, let's just answer both. Okay. Um, I okay. could be where they wanted to know. So sure. I'm guessing sure. it's probably cellular wireless. Okay. We definitely do not recommend that you use cellular wireless as your primary. Mm -hmm. One, it's, it's, be, it's metered, so you don't, yeah, that's, that's one issue. The other issue is with 4G LTE, it's not that you can't get good connections, but, but it's subject to the signal availability at that customer location. So, you know, you run into the strength of signal, those kind of things. So you have to be, just kind of watch that. So when we're talking about 4G LTE with, with cradle points, we recommend that you use that as a backup. So we would have a dedicated circuit that's primary. We would typically have SD-WAN, and then we would have running that's all active, and then we would have the cellular in a passive mode so that if the primary circuit goes completely down, it can fell over on a temporary basis to that cellular network. Now, the other solution would be fixed wireless. So we can do fixed wireless. That's more of a dedicated circuit, and it's not metered. So that is available in a lot of major markets, but also a lot of rural markets as well. So when you have a lot of multi-location, especially when you get into things like oil and gas industry, those kind of things, sometimes rural health care, um, they don't always have fiber. 
or dedicated internet uh, to a location. And so in those cases, usually fixed wireless is going to be your best solution with maybe 4G LTE as a backup or satellite as a backup. So satellite's fine for data. You obviously run into issues when you're trying to run UCAS over, over satellite. It's not that it can't be done, but um, you have to reconfigure latency configurations and some things like that, and there's a lot of delay. It's, it's, it's not meant for it, but for a temporary backup, it can work. Right, okay, and Tom, just so we have uh, the name in the hat for that question, that was Lawrence R, as in Romeo, Lawrence. Next question, uh, we have so many questions. <laughs> Do you manage endpoint security as well? And let's just take that as a question. It's a long question, but we'll start with that one. Okay, so we will, once we, yes and no. So we can a little bit with the Cisco Meraki. That's our whole point for bringing in the Fortinet um, application is so that we can manage endpoint uh, security. Now we're not talking about things inside the LAN. We would be talking about our own edge equipment, obviously. Okay, great. And then um, that question came from Dozen, D-O-E-Z-E-N. Next question from John, and this is John V as in Victor. Since you offer a full range of services, do you work with the customer to do a broad assessment of what they're doing and how AirSpring can help, particularly Absolutely. if they have security gaps? So I, I would definitely say yes to that question because I've seen you guys helping us with customers. Very, very good analysis. But I'll let you take that, Scott. Sure, and I'll, and I'll keep it simple. Absolutely. In fact, we encourage the advisors that we work with to um, let our regional channel managers who are trained, but also if they want to, to bring on a, uh, one of our solution engineers and have an engineer on that can kind of start asking good discovery questions. What we find is the more quality discovery we do, the better the client is served. A lot of, a lot of clients don't even realize they have gaps, so to speak. So yeah. that, that happens a lot. And we may not be the right solution for every client, and that's okay as well, but at least we've helped discover those gaps. Yep. Okay, next question, and then we'll let you continue because there's so many. Do you deal with uh, – this is a good question because it kind of tees you right up for a successful answer. Do you deal with the outages directly with the major vendor? Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. So <laughs> we are – we use the term NNI in our network, and what that means is network-to-network -network interface. And so what that means is we're not just reselling, for example, an AT&T circuit. We're actually bonded electronically with AT&T. And so we're bringing it from the customer's prem, customer's premise, uh, via layer two loop into our, our closest point of presence, or our POP. And from there, it's in our network. So, so we are, our NOC is working directly with, if, if AT&T happens to be the underlying network provider for that location that we're using, then our NOC is dealing directly with AT&T's NOC. Great. All right. Thanks for all those questions. And in fact, let me, let me just expand on that, which I don't have really in the presentation, but one of our advantages that we have because we deal with so many underlying network providers is we can provide uh, network diversity across the country by location. So if, let's say a customer has five locations. <clears throat> um, we can, if, if we needed to, we could actually have a different underlying network provider for each location. And for a lot of our larger companies that we deal with, our mid-sized enterprise companies, a lot of times they do back primary and backup DIA circuits. So they're running two fiber circuits into that, into that one location. Well, they want to make sure that that's a diverse uh, network. We can actually do that. So we can mm -hmm. have one, we could have AT&T coming in one side, we could have whatever other provider coming in on the other side of the building. And so they've got one provider to deal with, one bill, one customer service center, but we're providing diverse networks. Um, so that's an advantage that we can offer. Great. And Tom, for your hat record there, that was Jonathan W. Jonathan W. as in whiskey. Any more questions? There's a lot, but we want to hear from you too. So I've we'll let got, you keep and, going. That's okay. And I'm down to my last two, really two slides in the last okay. two okay. meeting slides. So we're close. So and it's really the last two here are more recaps. So why AirSpring? That's the whole, whole key of what I'm trying to get across. We truly are a one-source solution, uh, both domestically and globally, uh, as far as that's concerned. We're outside of any single carrier network foot footprint. Because we've got so many underlying wholesale network agreements, um, we've got fully redundant. And we can bring in, by different locations, whatever transport node is needed or mode is needed. So, you know, like that client that has five locations, 
maybe three of those need to be fiber, but two of those need to be cable that's coming in because that's all they need. There are three or four person offices. They don't need a, you know, they don't want to pay for a DIA, a, a 50 meg DIA circuit. So we can bring in, in a coax circuit or, or, or something of that nature. Um, so that's some of the advantages that we can do. I won't go through and walk all this. We've kind of talked about this. It's really just having as many services as you can under one umbrella so that you're dealing with one customer service center and one company uh, to get help when you need it. So I'll walk through these real quick. This is what we call our AirSpring Advantage, and it's, it's 10 things. So we've got award-winning cloud products. We've, uh, one slide in there showed you we've got more than 100 industry awards uh, for different product sets that we have. Um, experience and stability. Uh, we've been in business 19, soon to be 20 years. Um, we're privately held. We are profitable. That's a big thing. Uh, we are debt free as, as well. We are not looking to be acquired. We're a family owned and operated business. We're a fully managed network with QoS. Okay, so when, when it brings into us, we can do quality of service because it's in our network. Um, that's, a, that's a huge deal. Number four is a biggie eliminate finger pointing. So a lot of times you have a customer that says, I've got, you know, my internet provider is this vendor over here, my UCAS provider is this vendor over here. They've got problems on their phone when they're, when they're talking and they're trying to figure out where's the problem and you've got both vend vendors pointing fingers at each other. It's them, no it's them, it's your network, no it's your UC provider. Well with us, if you're using us for your managed internet and your voice, we're the one provider. Okay, so there, it eliminates a lot of that finger pointing that goes on. Largest available coverage. Basically, I mean, if it's available in the United States to be covered, we can get it covered. There's just I don't know of any place that we can't actually get covered. Now you're going to run into certain very small situations where you have a mom and pop local exchange company that can't port numbers. So in a UCAS situation, UCAS portability could be an, an issue, but now less than 2% of the country has unportable numbers. So that's rarely an issue, but it does happen occasionally. Um, number six, reliable and diversified network. We've kind of talked about that. You've got customers, different sites, but they're all coming into our, our AirSpring network. So our network really is one giant MPLS network. It used to be just domestically, now it's actually globally. Single point of contact, that's a big deal. It helps for accountability, but the other reason is this. Think about a multi-location, you know, um, 100 location retail uh, chain. You know, every store, you got people working in that store. If something goes down, and you're using different vendors for every different location, different local phone companies, some local ISP, you know, some phone, independent phone dealer for a, a key system that they have in there. Who does that employee call? Well, if we're providing all those services, they call the same number for everything. So it's one number to call. Number eight is free air care. What that means is this. You can always call our customer service line and our knock. We, we don't discourage that at all. But we have some customers that actually want to do some things themselves. So we have an advanced portal that they can also do a lot of things self-service if they want to. They can see their billing, they can re reroute toll-free numbers, they can manage their DIDs in real time, they can place trouble tickets if they want to. Speaking of trouble tickets, because we monitor circuits proactively, 85% um, of the trouble tickets are actually, we notify the customer that there's been an issue that we're already working before they even know it's, know it's happening. Uh, so it's a big deal. That's part of the, the number nine network uh, servicing. And then last but not least, premier support package with an escalation list up to our CEO. We're just trying to be as high touch and as personable as, as we can be. That's, that's our advantage, being a smaller carrier. We're, we're essentially a mid-sized carrier. You know, we're doing about 100 million a year. We've got about 260 employees uh, globally. So um, we're a mid-sized carrier. And last but not least is just the closing slide, and that's it. Just a reminder of the different services we offer. I'm open for questions, thoughts, or you can take it over, Sonia. Yeah. Well, let's do a drawing now because that was a lot of information, and I want to get everybody's attention back. You can go ahead and even close out your slide there, and, and then we can do that drawing so we can see Tom. Tom, you want to go ahead and just do a drawing um, so that we can get one of those $25 gift cards given away? And if you win, please uh, email me. Um, my email address is sonia.m, as in Mike, at technologysource.com. All right, are we ready for the first name? All right, drum roll. All right, here we go. 
we go. It's probably backwards. Lawrence. 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 All right. Congratulations, Lawrence. Twenty-five dollar gift card in the mail or in the email on its way to you once you uh, just reach out to me so I have all your current information. Yeah, and, those are right. Amazon, right. and those are Amazon gift cards. Oh, good. Fun. Congratulations. All right. Now, in my good um, old Kansas City cap, right? I could have a cowboy hat, you'd think, right? That's what I figured. <laughs> all right. So let's do, let's do some more questions. So this one is from John B. John B. is in Bravo. That is, might a vendor hit its limit and start running into diminishing returns being a single source provider? What do you think, Scott? Um, yeah, I, to <laughs> be honest with you, question. Yeah, it kind of depends. It depends on really what the what the vendor type is. So all I can do is tell with AirSpring, because we um, utilize so many underlying networks, for example, for connectivity, we really don't run into that um, issue. Uh, we we just don't. Um, okay. Um, next question, and he's sorry about the typos. And this one's from Jonathan W. W is in whiskey. We have, with the WAN monitoring service, can you manage a thorough security risk kind of detection from things like phishing, intrusion, denial of service on a Cisco Fortinet Palo Alto devices? Is that something that is in the wheelhouse? We can do some DDoS protect, pr protection. I can't speak to the Fortinet yet. That's our security, as far as managed security services, are going to greatly expand. But I can't really expound on that yet until we bring the Fortinet product online. So I apologize not giving a good answer to that, but that's just the truth. <laughs> Great. This one is from Mark S. S. says in Sierra. That is, do you charge any fiber build out back to the client? So yes, if if, it, if the underlying network provider has to charge us, then yes, we will. Sometimes we can uh, amateurize that a little bit. That's on an ICB case, you know, uh, case, individual case basis, depending on what the cost is, that kind of thing. You know, so, but it, it does happen. Um, I can tell you on a, from a process issue, the underlying network providers, they will not do site surveys until an order is placed. And mm -hmm. that means our, our NOC or our provisioning team placing an order for that, that network circuit. So what happens is on some of that stuff, we won't know until we actually do that. They do a site survey and then they come back and they'll either give us a FOC date or they'll tell us, nope, we got the construction. Um, now, sometimes they'll say we do construction. There's no charge on that. And obviously, we don't not going to charge anything. Um, if they do charge us, it's a pass through. But one thing, but one thing to remember for the customer is that because customers get worried sometimes because they have to actually place an order before they know that um, right. they are right. released from liability for that location if uh, if we can't honor the price. So if we have okay. to come back with a build out, and the customer can be released for that right. location, not necessarily all their locations, but for that location without financial liability. Great, great. Well, I'm sorry we can't get to all of these great questions. Um, just for good measure, since there's two really good questions here and we're not going to have time, can you add Scott S. and George, Scott S. is in Sierra and George K. is in Kilo into that uh, little cap ears there, Tom? And then let's do a drawing for another $25 gift card, and then we will do our big $100 uh, drawing. All right, just about done adding those two individuals. And, and while you're doing that, Scott, thank you so much for coming today. It was really great to hear more about AirSpring and to see what you guys are doing. I love this uh, topic of vendor consolidation. Having been uh, management, managing many vendors in the past, um, it's a lot of work. And so this is a great solution to reduce or eliminate that vendor count. All right, drum roll, drum roll. All right, here we go. Hal G. G. All right, Hal, congratulations. You get a $25 gift card. Reach out to me, Sonia.m at Technology Source. Now, this is open to everyone on the call, so thank you for those of you who stayed till the end. Um, we really appreciate that. What we're going to do now is find your chat box, not your answer box. You get one, ch one shot at this. I asked Scott before this call to pick a number for me between 1 and 100. Anyone who gets the closest without going over gets the $100 gift card. If you hit it on the head and you're the first one, then you get that gift card. 
All right, let's see. No one's hit it yet. No one's hit it yet. Somebody hit it. Somebody hit it. Somebody hit it. It was Drew H. H is in Hilo. Congratulations. H is in helicopter. Good job, Good Drew. Job. I know Drew. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you guys. Um, have a great day and enjoy, and thank you. Happy Tuesday. Um, thank you to all. I see a ton of advisors on here, um, and we really appreciate you. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you to, I see a few uh, new people who I, I don't know who you are, so um, nice to meet you, and we'll hopefully see you um, not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after. We have a dark Tuesday next Tuesday, um, but then we're, we're going to jump right back in. So have a wonderful week, and we'll see you guys in just a couple of weeks. Thanks again, Tom. Have a good week, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye, Scott. Thank you. Bye. 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 Nice Bye.